Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to New York Music Month. My name is Sharon Gehens from the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. We're the city agency that supports all the creative sectors in New York, and I'm the person who created New York Music Month and does all the partnerships and programs to support the industry in the city. I'm actually out and about in one of the many events happening this month. That's why it's New York Music Month. But I just wanted to drop in to say hi before this awesome panel of amazing experts. We're going to talk about a topic which we get a lot of questions about how to either start your career or advance your career in the music industry. Emily White is a force to be reckoned with, as are the rest of the women on the panel. So I hope you guys enjoy today's programming. We have a whole calendar of free events happening the entire month. So check it out at NY Music Month. NYC, and I hope to see you out and about. Amazing. Thank you so much for that, Shira. And we are so excited to be here. Um, my name is... Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, Shira. Um, really, really appreciate that intro. Um, I'm your moderator, Emily White. I'm the author of a few books. Um, including Interning 101, which is a big thing that we're going to talk about today. I'm also an Amazon number one bestselling author of How to Build a Sustainable Music Career and Collect All Revenue Streams and host the number one music business podcast globally. Um, so let's bring on our esteemed panelists. Um, and I'd like uh, each person to introduce themselves. Um, maybe we could start with Christine. Hi, everybody. I'm Christina Sazwa. Um, despite the accent, I am based in London, though I'm currently in, in Portugal. Um, I'm really excited to be on this panel. Um, I know my background is in these kind of small spaces. I currently work in ticketing. I serve on a few different boards. I've worked in major label, and I have made my way into the music industry into three different countries at this point, so I have plenty to say on the topic. Incredible. And Nurit, can you please introduce yourself? And I hope I said your first name correctly. Nurit, yeah, oh, yeah. Nurit, like, thank like you. Neat, sweet Nurit. Uh, <laughs> Emily, thank you so much for having me. I'm the executive director of the Music Forward Foundation. And we are a 31-year-old organization um, dedicated to breaking the barriers of entering and accessibility into music and live entertainment. And personally, as an, as an artist, uh, for many years, I was in a band in my 20s, but how do we continue to support uh, young people in their path in charting their careers into this really dynamic, uh, viable space to be in? So I'm excited to be a part of this conversation today. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nareet. Um, and Nancy Tarr. Hi, I'm Nancy Tarr, and I'm the executive director of Well Done. And we are a music industry nonprofit founded 12 years ago in memory of a, a vibrant young woman in her time named Emily Dunn, who wanted to work in the live events industry. And, and we're here to provide access and opportunities to college students who need financial assistance to work in the music space. So if you have a paid internship and you're seeking some extra funding for your apartment, Nancy, let's well have you, done. Let's we have, have you paid internship. Drop off video. We I'm have a mentorship program. There you go. Thank you. Nancy's on the road to Bonnaroo. And then just unmute yourself. Oh, is there. it not working so well? Yeah, no, you're good. Video? Crystal clear. You're good. Okay. So we have four programs that we run, uh, paid internships, mentorship, job shadowing, and externships. And as Emily said, yes, I'm en route. I'm in Tennessee on my way to Bonnaroo. But the main tenant is that we want to welcome students into the, the live event space, especially if you aren't in a music industry program and you're, you're seeking education and opportunities. And we partner a lot with Music Forward as well. Incredible. And Nancy is also, unless you want to share, a music business educator, runs the internship co-op program at Northeastern U University for the music business program. Um, and Christine, I'm sorry if I missed this. Can you share a little bit about the like uh, career networking groups you've been putting together? 
Sure, yeah, of course. I might not want to go too deep into everything. Um, yeah, so I run a conference called Measure of Music, which is a music tech and data conference and hackathon that happens annually. It's fully virtual, um, but it's a music and tech lover community, essentially. Um, and over the last few months, um, well, uh, two months ago now, I ran a career development workshop, basically, where I paired, well, industry executives with job seekers and these like roundtable discussions basically also offer up networking opportunities as well. Um, this runs very similarly to how my conference is structured my conference annually. Um, and then on top of that, um, I also post uh, weekly jobs to LinkedIn um, with the roundup of jobs that I see on the platform that are posted by humans rather than by companies um, just to avoid things like those jobs, those jobs postings basically. Um, so doing a lot in like the career development space. Um, I also host um, one-on-one group calls every Monday night. Um, with people that are job seekers, startup founders, artists, or whoever might be there that's looking for advice or help, basically. Wow. Um, if you get a chance, we would love if you could drop that info in chat, because that is yeah. gold. Um, okay, so this this panel is navigating your music career, how to enter and advance in the industry. I hear from students constantly, um, many of which are at you know prestigious music business programs. And the number one question I hear is, how do I get a job? Um, so that's what we're going to try to dispel today. And you certainly don't have to, um, you know, go to a, a fancy music business program to do that. So I know this is a big question and you all have incredible bios and journeys, but in short, um, and we'll start with Nareet, how did you enter the music industry? Uh, that That's a great question because I think that Ultimately, what you'll see is that it's a very unique and personalized path, right? This is, especially if you're entering it from a creative space as well, it's even more, you know, you're, you're, you're breaking your path and you're making it and building it along the way. Like I said, I was an, I was an artist. I come from the more dance and theater space. So um, that I landed in a band for a handful of years in my twenties, just, just made sense because I loved performing. I loved, uh, and as a, as a dancer, you're intrinsically connected to the music as well. Right. Um, and then I was running a, a similar pro a program in Los Los Angeles, I'm based here in, in Los Angeles, that's a sister program to like summer stage. So it was a free summer concert series. And that's when I really started getting uh, my ear tuned to all the global music out there because we were bringing in musicians from around the world and really understanding that cultural element of music and not just a sort of a contemporary um, en um, entertainment space of, of music, but really understanding the deep roots that, that music have in, in cultures, in, in um, countries around the world. And then it was interesting landing here six and six years ago at Music Forward. We sit inside of Live Nation, which is a, a lot about contemporary music, mm -hmm. right? And so this um, idea of coming back into this space and bringing all of my knowledge around entertainment and performance and education into this organization, making sure that that artist's lens is always discussed in a part of the conversation, because I think there are a number of young people that enter the music industry thinking they want to be a performer or an artist. And I think it's an imper imperative for all of us to continue to show the 360 view of what music and live can bring in in as well. So it's sort of like my personal journey in this space as well. So I I, I hope that that answered the question, but I, I love music as we all do when we understand that this is um, a universal language that we can leverage to bring a sort of, not to sound so grand, but like a shared humanity, frankly. That's also part of the story I think we all believe in too. Oh, so beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, so Christine was on my podcast and we did a deep dive into her extraordinary, her extraordinary career. So you can check that out. Um, if like, I learned so much talking to Christine, but in short, like, how did you enter the industry? Yeah. Um, I started booking shows when I was 15. Um, so live music, my, live music has always been my space. That's what I love. Um, my biggest claim to fame, um, still to this day, um, I booked my 16th birthday party and the headlining band for my 16th birthday party is a band called All Time Low. Um, I am from Baltimore, which is where they are from. They're only two years older than me. So this was not very impressive in 2006. It just sounds really impressive in retrospect. Um, but that is how I got my start. 
Um, and then from there, I, I started running a print magazine about local music from where I was from. It expanded to the East Coast. Um, by the time I finished wrapped up when I was 21, I had a staff of 12 on the East Coast. Um, and I got my first like paying office job by literally emailing a company in Baltimore where I was from that sold concert tickets. And I said, hey, I book shows um, for fun, basically. Can I do any kind of marketing for you? I literally cold emailed them. And they were like, sure, we'll pay you, I think at the time, $8 an hour. And I was like, cool, that sounds amazing. Let's do that. Um, and that was my first like paying job in the music industry. And then from there, I ended up working for Atlantic Records as a contractor through a Craigslist ad, like all kinds of weird ways where things kind of piece together to put together my career, basically. <laughs> um, kidding, not kidding. We could end the panel right there um, because, you know, with the all time low story and like starting a zine, you started by doing you know, and then you started by reaching out or, you know, didn't start, but like grew from there um, by reaching out. Right. So I really, really hope everyone heard that because um, Christine's success is absolutely no accident. So thank you for that. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. And Nancy, how did you get your start in music? So I just want to echo what you said. Doing is the key to your success in the music industry. You do not wait for someone to give you a job. If you want to do something, you just do it like Christine did. So my start, um, you know, in high school, I was in musical theater and sang in a lot of plays. I went to college for theater and then I moved to New York City and did a lot of off Broadway and, and realized I was more of a singer than an actor. And then I moved to Los Angeles. I worked at Paramount Pictures in the music department. That was just, I, I signed up for one temp agency and that happened to be, their client happened to be Paramount Pictures. And I grew up in upstate New York. And I say it's radio free upstate New York. And I really didn't know anything about the music industry other than I love music. And I also loved performing. And while I was at Paramount, I actually ended up singing a song that was nominated for an Emmy. So I had a dual track of singing I did a lot of session work in LA, but I also really loved the business. And then I moved to back to New York and worked at Arista and RCA Records. Just by then, I just, everything was sort of word of mouth. I was on the phone with a friend of mine who was moving to Los Angeles. And I said, well, who's going to take your job? And she said, well, maybe you. And so I interviewed with her boss and got the job, but then she decided not to move. And then there was another woman who I knew we met in a restaurant. I know that when I have these interviews in weird places, I'm going to get the job. So if I'm meeting my next boss in a restaurant, I'm like, all right, I got this job. So, you know, I just started networking, trying to figure out where I wanted to work and what I wanted to do. And then I went back to New York and actually started a band in New York and did a lot of open mics, but I left New York, moved to Washington, D.C. That's really where I had my band, where Dead Girls and Other Stories, toured up and down the East Coast, played in Lilith and Horde. But, and that's when the internet was exploding. My band was on mp3.com. We were a number one artist there. I participated in the IPO from my desk at the Recording Industry Association, where I also handled artist relations and government affairs. So, I really liked to surround myself and always was learning about the music industry. And then yeah, I sort of moved around a lot, went back to New York, then I went to Los Angeles. I was the music coordinator on the uh, film Eight Mile, but I always wanted to teach. So I went back to school to get a degree in music because I wanted to be a K through 12 educator. And by the time I finished my degree, I ended up uh, being offered a position at SUNY Oneonta uh, to teach music industry. I also have two teenagers who are actors in their own right. My son was a professional uh, boy soprano. So I was a, a momager and we traveled the world together. And so that was really fun as well. So I've never really left the industry. I've just really seen every side of the industry. And now I am running well done. I've been doing this for seven years. And I also, as Emily mentioned, uh, manage the co-op program at Northeastern. So that's sort of the fast track path of my music career. Yeah, and co-op means interning. I went to Northeastern and Nancy does that for the music business program. And I love like, you know, also that you highlighted um, these aren't like straight and narrow paths. You know, you went from, I, I, I've known you a long time and I know you well. I didn't know you were the music coordinator on 8 Mile. 
And you went from that to getting an education, uh, getting, you know, getting an education degree. So um, yeah, there's no, you know, right or wrong or, or straight and narrow or all, all that good stuff. Um, so for the panel, you know, feel free, you know, anyone can jump in here. Does one need a degree or any sort of formal training to enter the music industry? I always feel really bad when I answer this question because I actually have three degrees, um, but no one needs any of them. Uh, <laughs> the reason I have three degrees, I'm a data scientist, um, so some people do require a, a degree for the data science part of that. Um, but in general, um, no one cares. No one's actually asked me for my degrees. Um, the only reason why I went to school for so much is I learned really well in a school setting. If you learn really well on YouTube, learn there. If you learn really well, you know, taking one on courses, learn there. If you learn really well being hands on and just doing the work, just learn there. Um, I think the barrier to entry is so low. I always say the best and worst part about the music industry is that anybody can work in the music industry. So you can just go do the thing. And oftentimes, I actually think it, people that study and then don't do any work, they don't do any projects, they don't do anything in the music industry while they're studying, usually come into the industry at a disadvantage because there are kids that were 17. I started booking shows when I was 15. So by the time I was 21, I had five years of experience. Um, and so without that, um, it makes it really, really challenging. So getting started as quick as possible, doing what you want to do, I think is a top priority. And then learning how you learn. And I believe learning is really, really important. Education is very important. But learning how you learn best is the key to moving forward. Great. And Nancy, what are you seeing? Okay, so that is an amazing perspective. And I love that Nareet was, um, you know, shaking your head no. Um, I am a product of a music business program. Again, the one that uh, Nancy runs the co-op program for. What are you seeing in the students um, that are successful in your music business program? Because if, if getting a music business degree equaled success, then we'd have a lot more students with jobs. And I mean, in general. Well, I think Christine really uh, hit on something. And it, it's that, that doing, you have to learn by doing. And that is the cornerstone of the program at Northeastern with a co-op program. And you know, I'm about to write to my class now and tell them all the things that I think they should be doing this summer in order to prepare for uh, September. I, I think that I think that what people need to be successful in the music industry is a professional work ethic. So you have to have some demonstrated experience that you can do the thing, really. And I I think that one of the problems that people might be running into when they talk to you, Emily, is, you know, they're seniors and they haven't been doing the things that they said they wanted to do when they became a freshman in college or even, you know, when you're in high school. Christine's a, a great example of this. You can do so much as a high school student as well. And kids have fan accounts for their favorite artists and they end up getting hired to run their social media. I, I did teach a class in the Bandier program at Syracuse. I had two students in there who were actually working professionally handling social media for professional artists. And one actually started out as a Stan account. So I think that I think that education is important. I don't think it has to take place in the four walls of an academic institution. I think, Christine, what you said, YouTube, however you learn. And I think that sometimes people who work in the music industry are neurodiverse and so they have to lean into that and understand their strengths and weaknesses as well yeah and um just to echo that i feel really strongly like for those that are in music business programs i mean nancy pretty much said that um that is the opportunity to go out into the field do as much as possible bring it back into the classroom and share with your classmates which are your community and network like, this was awesome. This sucked. I want to recommend you for this. What do you think about that? Um, so you can learn and, and grow together. Um, we are going to move on because I have a million more questions <laughs> that I want to dig in on. Um, also for the panel, is working in the music industry glamorous? Christine laughs. Nareet, do you want to take this? Sure. I mean, you see Christine is, is sitting in an airport right now. Nancy is in, in en route. It, it's, a, it's a very um, uh, tough and um, uh, physically, emotionally uh, can be a really difficult industry to navigate. Um, you need to understand, and this is part of 
you hear us saying like, just do because you need to understand your personal skills, your personal characteristics that in, and, and the spaces that you thrive in, you know, we hear oftentimes like, oh, I want to be in this field. And we said, okay, do you like lots of things coming at you? Oh no. Right. I like a safer, quieter space. Well, then maybe you want to consider this, but that's learning. That's learning by doing, that's learning by conversation, that's learning with network. Um, and it's all of that, but it is not very glamorous at all, um, at all. So I know this is a, it's a real thing. Um, and it's a, a tough industry, um, oftentimes. Yeah. I really think it's about being a geek about the work, you know? And so if, if you try an internship or you try music experience and you're like, this sucks, that's okay. Just be a fan. It's totally okay to be a fan. Um, I had a young co-manager once um, say to me, he's like, yeah, I woke up early. I got my, all my emails out to Europe. He was all like naturally high on like getting all his emails out to Europe. I'm like, oh, this guy's a lifer, you know? Um, so it is like that grunt work. And, um, you know, not that I think anyone in this panel like takes the experiences that we've had for granted, but like it does get old, you know? So it needs to be about, you know, balance and, um, you know, the people you work with and stuff like that. Emily, you just said the word. Oh, I'm sorry, Christine. I was just going to say that you just said the word balance. I think that the music industry is glamorous, but there are many days that are not glamorous. When you get those high points, you know, then you know that that's why you're there for it. But I think it's very important to find balance. Like I'm about to go to Bonnaroo. I've been looking at the weather. It's going to be highs of 92. We're checking out the schedules. You know, there's gigs we want to see that are at two or three o'clock in the morning, but I am working also, you know, I have a, like a nine to five work that I'm, I'll be doing there as well for Northeastern and well done. So I'm going to be around the clock for, you know, 24 hours really working. And I know that. And so I'm really preparing for that experience. Christine? Yeah, I um, that I think people get in their head about when I think of the music and I say that it's, I think it's important to debunk. Um, you know, I, I've been in the music industry for almost 20 years. Um, I just went to basically the equivalent of the UK um, Grammys um, for the first time this past year, the Brits. Um, I think people go into the music industry thinking they're going to be at the Grammys immediately. They're going to be, you know, at, you know, Coachella immediately. They're going to be at Glastonbury immediately. Maybe. But, you know, there is a lot of jobs. You know, I work at Universal Music Group. There's, a, I think, the that there's 7,000 people there. All 7,000 of them do not get to go to the Grammys, I promise. So just because you you get the marketing coordinator role or whatever it is, right? just because you get the role, you're the thing, you think, if you think you're going to end up being, like, you know, hanging out with, like, you know, Cardi B or, you know, someone every day, you're probably not going to be. Um, And so I think it's really important to, like, you, like Emily was saying, is, like, you, you have to be a fan of music, but you also, like, have to really want this because, like, one of the... Like one of the things I find most exciting is like walking through an office and hearing a new artist and realizing that you have a hit. Like hearing that, that is a thing that like, that gets me more excited than like, like Brits are really cool. I had a really great time. Um, But like that, I remember the first time I heard Billie Eilish walking, through, like I heard it walking through the office and I stopped where I was, I literally stopped my tracks and I turned into the room. I was like, who is this? Oh my God. Like that is, that's the magic. That's the fact that that's like what feels glamorous to me more than anything, like getting the opportunity here before everyone else feels glamorous. And so if it's not, if it's not those things, um, if it's like the expectation of like putting on like a shiny dress or the expectation of being in the studio with big artists, like that might not happen. Um, so you have to find your joy and what like makes you excited about doing this work basically. Yeah, I love the satisfaction of execution. And I love, um, I, I mean this like not famous people, like I love all the people I've met and all the relationships that I've cultivated and built from these weird experiences of like sharing a hotel room with Nancy at Bonnaroo or whatever. Um, so yeah, I just want to, you know, I wanted, well, we successfully right. maybe dispelled some of the glamour. Yeah. Nareen. And Emily from the live experience as well, like it's spectacular when you're in a venue and you're helping run, when you're helping put the show on and you see it happen and, you know, you get the tingles and all of that stuff. But even as a general manager of a venue, you may be cleaning that bathroom. That's you right. cannot not pick up that broom if it needs to happen. And you can't, you're dealing with all of these other things that may 
you know, change the the glow of that event, but you still got the goosebumps when that happens. So it's that balance too that Nancy was talking about. You'll get- Oh my gosh, such a good fun. point. Um, if you're interested in entering the live space, Peter Shapiro's book is the best, um, who's like one of the most famous concert promoters in the world. And it is about- clean bathrooms and short lines and um, really not glamorous things. And I won't digress too much, but I also run a, a nonprofit called I Voted. We book data-driven concerts that the public enters on election night with a selfie from outside their polling place. You don't have to remember any of that. But as I've entered the nonprofit space, other like non-music nonprofits will approach us and want to book them talent, usually because they're already underwater, because they think it's going to be fun. Um, and then they're dealing with like heat and logistics and insurance and permits and... Um, you know, lots of things like that. So anyway, that's why you want to intern and, you know, get yourself out there and and learn from um, those who have experience, which is a great segue into, um, you know, this is obviously a, a New York Music Month panel. So for those who live in major markets like New York City, how can students and those looking to enter the industry, like put themselves out there in real life? Like what kind of events can they be going to to meet people? New York Music Month. Yeah, New York, yes. this is, that's great. You know, we, through COVID, uh, you know, we started putting a lot of our stuff virtually. And at the end of last year, we did a panel about emerging professionals. There was young people that on the panel, not fancy panel, like this, this panel, right? No, but uh, you, know, um, you just in call, you know, senior in college, just out of college a year or two. And um, we had over 500 people read RSVP and we went, oh, there is something about creating these spaces. And you have to remember everybody, your network is right around you already, right? And so uh, get to know, you know, the, Music Month right now. Well done. Christine's work, uh, Measure for Music. Music Forward. We have a lot of events happening, both virtually and in person, that you guys can get involved with. And, uh, and we're understanding that we need to do better from the industry on bridging those gaps, right? Because there is not education. There is a separation between industry and education, and we need to step in and start supporting your paths coming into this industry. And so once you start connecting with all of our organizations, you'll start seeing other opportunities and other organizations. And really it's about building that swell around you. Um, and again, it's not even that you have to be doing that, you know, internship at that label. You can tell your story in that jobs that you are doing already about how you are a leader, how you communicate, your adaptability. Think about those skills within the industry that are key and important and continue to build those skills. And then you can talk about it and share it in your resume. And that's how we can really start building that network and creating those steps into the industry and your path here. Love that. Christine, what should people be checking out in, in London or equivalent cities? Yeah, yeah. I will also, I have to, of course, add that I heard the virtual event was going on in my event just actually had 3,000 registrations um, because, you know, the music industry is bigger than the major markets. And I think it's really important for the accessibility. But if you are in the major markets or if you are visiting the major markets, um, you know, I think it's really important to check out the, the music organizations that exist in those markets. Um, some prime examples, actually, regardless of even the big, big markets, would be organizations like uh, Women in Music, organizations like um, Grammy U, for example, which have chapters all over the country. Um, um, and then also in, here in the UK and Europe, um, there's She Said So, is a um, gender minority women in music organization that has events continuously. Uh, we have The Great Escape, um, which is um, down in Brighton, as well as Brighton uh, uh Brighton Music Conference, um, and then there are just tons of different meetups. Um, what's really great about the major markets is like the companies themselves will host different events. Um, so I have seen Sony host like internship parties and things along those lines. They're trying to meet new, um, you know, new people that want to be in their they want in their like pipeline. Um, and like what I always tell people, and this is also the same for like finding a job, is that you should follow the companies that you're interested in on every platform possible. Um, because they might post something somewhere. Like I remember when I moved to Stockholm, I wanted to get a job at Spotify. Um, and so I follow Spotify, every single Spotify account they had. 
like they had Twitter accounts that were just to like support. I followed that one too. I didn't care. You know, you just follow them all. And so once in a while they'll post, hey, we're doing something or we're hosting this or here's how you get tickets to this and follow them. Um, and then make it your priority to go to those events and meet the people that you're looking to meet. Um, that also I think helps with burnout in a lot of ways because if you if you feel like you have to go to every single thing, especially in major markets where there's tons going on, you're going to really stress yourself out. So identifying the best opportunities to get what you're actually after is also incredibly important. Yes, meeting lots of people is great. Yes, expanding your network is great. But especially like not everybody that works in the music industry is an extrovert. Um, so if, if you have a social battery that drains, um, making sure you prioritize where you're going to use that social battery, I think is also incredibly important. I love it. And we're going to talk about non-major market stuff in a second, but Nancy, what's going on in Boston? Well, I was going to say, well, I love that you brought up Christine introvert and extrovert, because I think that's really important. I think one of the, 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 the tools that I can give to students is to help them better, better understand where they fit in the music industry based on the, the conversation that we have. And I actually do talk to readers about that too about which positions do they think are best suited for introverts and um, extroverts and in Boston there's a ton going on but I, I would say across the board you know there are all these conferences that go on New York Music Month the event that just took place last uh, week that was free but all of these events need volunteers mm-hmm. I I always say, don't ever let money be the barrier to you getting where you want to go. And if you live in a a non-music market as well, there's always a theater or a nonprofit where you can get even what Nareet was talking about, transferable skills, your leadership skills, your adaptability, your resourcefulness. So you can develop these transferable skills really wherever you are. So I always say volunteering is a great way to get your foot in the door. I volunteered at an event in Washington, D.C., and that's actually how I got my job at the RIAA because I, I met a person who was probably giving an award, and I struck up a conversation with him. The next thing I knew, I was sitting in his office interviewing for a job. So I think that volunteering is, is the way to go, especially if you don't really know where you want to be in the music industry. But Boston, we just had Boston Calling, so that's you know another opportunity all these festivals are always seeking gig workers i think doing gig work is a great way to to break into the industry all the venues record stores wherever people gather to talk about music and Nareet has said this a couple times is you know your network is your peer group and even emily you talked about you know going out in the field and then coming back to the classroom to to talk about what you learned i always tell my students especially when i'm in these big classes of 50 to 100 students, I say, just look to your left and your right. These are your coworkers. You're going to come up with these people. And now we have social media where kids can just connect online as well. And you can see what other people are doing and you can even create your own network. I'm a big fan of sort of that collective mentality as well. There's strength in numbers. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Yeah. My first college class. And again, we, First, let me acknowledge, I guess there was some discrepancy on time, so I apologize about that. I think there's a bunch of people streaming in. Um, So this is going to be posted on YouTube. It'll be posted on New York Music Month's website. We're just about to get into the nitty gritty, so you missed some good tips, but I encourage you to check that out, and I think the city can also email you all the YouTube link to catch up. Um, So you do not need to go to college or a fancy music industry program um, to enter the industry, but I do want to say to Nancy's point... Um, the first college class I ever took when I was 17 years old was music industry one. And the perfect person sitting next to me is my neighbor in Brooklyn, 20 plus 25 years later or whatever. My first boss and my first internship ever when I was 19 and she was 23 is now one of my best girlfriends, also my neighbor in Brooklyn. So you are building your network from day one, whether, you know, you're at New York music months conference or, you know, if you were at like my event last week, like I came out a little bit before I'm like, Talk to the left, talk to, you know, start building your community now. Um, So yeah, that's a really, really good point. And I'm originally from a village in Wisconsin, okay? Um, Where, you know, when I was younger, I would say there's, there's no music industry. When in reality, now there are music industries and music industry ecosystems everywhere. I only acknowledge New York City because this is New York Music Month. Um, 
you know, really quick, like I totally took this for granted as a kid, but my parents' friends ran the music shop in town. And I didn't realize until like 20 years later that one of those people was on the board of NAM, which is the National Association of Music Merchants. So I think sometimes we don't always realize, um, you know, the folks that we have in our communities and, and networks. Um, but, you know, what are resources, you know, networking groups and communities to connect with, support each other and share tips? Because like I said, we're a network, we're, we're an ecosystem. Um, you know, where can folks go online to connect no matter where they are in the world? It's like, I think we're going to plug our organizations, yeah. all of us. 100%. <laughs> because, I, you know, that's what we've been, we've been, we, we saw the need. We saw the gap. We saw that there, um, there was a lot of uh, conversation about making the industry more accessible, but in practice, it wasn't happening. Um, and so we as organizations, all three of us, um, were leaning in resources and intentionality on creating those pathways. And, and I think that continuum of learning that we've been talking about, how do we make sure that not only everybody on this call, but in, I love your, your village in Wisconsin, that they are have access to this information to explore and be aware of all the careers and opportunities. How do we prepare the young people um, for these opportunities? And then how do we find those opportunities and not only open the door, but place young people into those, right? This is what Well Done is doing at Bonnaroo placing young people into opportunities and into roles. That's why we just launched 14 apprentice pathways with the Department of Labor saying, these are pathways that you guys should be recognizing and supporting as we were, are pulling young people into this space. So these the websites, Christine gave such an amazing list of, of other folks, whether it's on their Instagram posts, on their LinkedIn posts, like people are sharing information, opportunities, the list that Christine was talking about of the um, jobs as well. Find those that are presenting internships um, and, and, fought and, and continue to follow the, those organizations because there are resources out there now. Um, and we're trying to push that as much as we can uh, into education and into your, your hands as well, um, but continue to follow that. I think that there are some great resources um, and hopefully Hopefully we can maybe even pull a list together of, of those that are there as well. Yeah. And don't be afraid to reach out, um, you know, when you are applying for internships and, and looking um, to get into the industry. And um, now we're going to get into the nitty gritty. Um, how long should a resume be? One page. Thank you. As uh, someone that has run companies for a long time, I receive multi-page resumes um, from students. The standard is a one-page PDF um, and work with your advisor, you know, work with mentors on that. If my, no offense, <laughs> if my career at age 41 can fit on uh, one page, yours at age, you know, 20 whatever or entering the industry um, can as well. So that's really, really important. Um, this week, uh, I saw a post on Threads um, that said photographers of threads. How did you, how did you start getting paid work? And Molly Hudelson replied with cold emailing. Um, so with that in mind, how short should an email be to an industry person or really anyone? And what should it say and include? Good question. Um, it's short, um, get to the point. We have a lot of email three, to be honest. Um, so really it's, it should be who you are, why you're emailing them, how you're going to help them. It's pretty much what you need. Um, I think the email I sent to the company that I was in, that my first job ever, I think I said, hey, I use your platform all the time. I really like it. Um, I'm a student studying music business. I would love to help support you in marketing as I'm studying marketing. Could I be of help to you guys? And I think that was pretty much the entire length of the email. Um, I didn't need the life story. Um, I didn't do anything else. You know, If they wanted to hear more, they would basically. Incredible. I mean, that really, yeah, go ahead, Nuri. No, yeah, I mean, I know the shorter the better, frankly. It is the 
industry people do not have a lot of time and space to go go through a long email. Um, it's very quick. I do get a lot of approaches on LinkedIn. Like folks will see me in, in this, in this environment and then link me in and write a quick note. I am one of those folks that will grab half hour with someone because I want to, um, share that space with them and, and give any guidance or mentorship, uh, you know, to, to folks. So I always say, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I've also been burned by <laughs> some, some folks that I, I jump in. Not everybody will, will respond with that. Um, you do want to have a hook. So you, you know, in, in any sort of sales space, you want to know who you're reaching out to and find that connectivity point, right? Oh, you went to this school. I did too. You know, this person, I do too. Like find that, you know, uh, connection. Um, and that will really help, uh, with that, um, moving that relationship through, especially if it's a cold email. I love that. And, and Nareet, that is so generous of you. And I think a lot of industry people definitely do that. Um, but I encourage students and those looking to enter the industry to research Nareet's incredible career and research Christine and Nancy's careers. Um, because when someone emails me and says, um, can we do a Zoom or can I get coffee to hear you got, how you got started in the industry? I have given lengthy interviews on YouTube. My bio is on my company's website. You can check out my LinkedIn. Um, and to Christine's point on like, it's not like an ego thing, but like what you can do for them, you know, like your life story of like, I love music and this is why I want to do it. We're all that, you know, so saying to Christine, like, I really admire the work you're doing at Shoes. That was so impressive how you booked all time low as a 16 year old, you know, for your birthday party. Um, I'd love to learn more about the ticketing industry um, and, and your path to get there. Um, might, I mean, not to speak for you, Christine, but it's like, that's your story. Is, I just, you know, I can post it again, but it's like, I have probably like an hour and a half podcast interview with you about your career that exists already, you know? So, I mean, is that helpful to you all? Like some research in advance? Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really saying it feels like it's a waste of time. That's not for me. I mean, I can tell my story a billion times, but if you only get a half hour with anybody and you ask them to repeat the thing that they have already said countless times, what was the point of the conversation? Sometimes I think people reach out just because they want to touch point. They're like, oh, now this person is in my network, but they're not getting a, it's not an actual value exchange. And if you ask just like, hey, you know, let me tell you about your story. I don't remember any person I've had a conversation with where I just told them about my story, to be completely honest. So like if they were to come back to me six months later and ask for a reference or ask for introduction, I probably wouldn't remember them because that conversation wasn't a particularly interesting one for me. It's my story over again. So the people I remember the most are the ones who are telling me about their story, telling me about their background, asking me the questions, like actually getting to the point of moving the needle forward to where they're trying to go rather than just rehashing the things that are available, readily available to everybody, basically. I love that. And so when those looking to enter the industry are cold emailing, um, it, those short emails, you know, with a one page PDF, um, when should those emails be sent? And um, does anyone here ever schedule emails uh, to be sent at a more opportune time? I am a which is send those emails on Mondays and Tuesdays, make sure they land in the box. Because most people are looking at their emails on Mondays and Tuesdays and, and maybe doing the work more Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays. I would say, you know, I, I'm always talking to college students and even my own children. You know, they want to follow up on an interview that they had. And, you know, it's Friday afternoon and they haven't heard anything all week. And I say, don't send it today. Wait until Monday. And I just want to get back to the cold email idea, too. I do think... You know, I know we're going to run out of time here, but the cold email certainly should be brief. But if you are applying for a job and they ask for specific skills that you have, you do need to go into more detail. So cover letters, some companies don't ask for cover letters and they don't ask for them because they want to see if you'll go the distance and write a cover letter. And bigger corporations do want to know why you want to work at those companies as well. You can't be generic and write one cover letter for every single job for which you apply. So I know we haven't gotten to cover letters, but I think the cold email definitely is brief. Nareet, I'm like you, you can connect with me on LinkedIn and I, I will talk with you as well. But I think what Christine said, that value exchange, you wanna be specific, 
but what what value are you providing also for that person? Do you see that they're working on a project where they might need some help? I love that. And there's tools like Boomerang for Gmail that are free where you can schedule emails um, to arrive on a Monday or Tuesday in a more opportune time if you're not available to send messages. Because to Nancy's point, your the goal is for your email to get read, okay? Um, and you also might want to throw, well, Boomerang can do this too. Um, email tracking is a really incredible tool um, because then it shows if your email has been read or not. And if it hasn't, um, then maybe it went into spam. And especially if you're a student, I encourage you to um, set up a Gmail um, .edu email addresses can go in a spam and you might not have um, access to that uh, forever. So, okay, so you've you've scheduled your email, you know, you sent it on a Monday or Tuesday and you don't hear back. Um, when should you, and, and you see some email tracking, so you know there's a human on the other end. Um, when should you follow up? Um, I would add, I mean, Everyone's probably different, obviously, um, because I do so much extracurricular outside my day job. I only have time to respond to personal emails on the weekend. So you won't get, if you email me on Monday, you're not going to get a response until probably Sunday. Um, so I think everyone's different. And that goes to the next question of just like, give it at least seven days. Um, people are busy. <laughs> give them some time to actually get there because everyone has their own cycle as to how they respond. Um, I will add, it's funny because when you asked, you know, when should that email be sent, I was thinking an entirely different way, not by day of week. But one of the things I always say is um, I don't reach out to people until I have a reason to reach out, basically. Um, no matter, and I've done that my entire career, essentially, from when I was very junior to now. Um, I think people sometimes think, assume that people are very senior in their roles, always get responses, always get callbacks, whatever it might be. But that's not the case. And so there's people that I very much admire in the music industry that I've never reached out to because I didn't have anything to say yet. Um, and if there became a time where there was a project that would be interesting to work on together, or even if it was an article they wrote that was interesting or whatever it might be, this is the time I'm going to reach out because I have something to say. But I think sometimes people reach out just for the sake of reaching out without any, again, no value to exchange, no information to provide, nothing. There's nothing there. So it's really hard for that to be a memorable situation rather than like, oh, I'm reaching out because I now have something important to say that I think will improve the relationship that I'm hoping to develop with this person, basically. Amazing. And say you had, you know, you have, you're using email tracking and you're not getting any red receipts. So maybe it's going into spam. Is it okay to call and say, did you get my application? I mean, if you're applying for an internship or entry level yes. or something, not just like I, Christine, I want to hang out with you. I think it's okay to call. And I, I have, uh, I am patiently persistent. And I think that if you are patiently persistent, always um, with a positive attitude when you're following up. Christine's right. People are busy. And, you know, that email might have come and gone and they might have looked at it and said, oh, I need to respond to that. Or so I'm fine if people follow up with me. And, you know, a telephone call, how old school. I might not answer that call, but if you leave a message, I'm probably going to listen to it but you know don't don't just wait 48 hours I definitely think you know Christine mentioned seven days could be even two weeks it, it really depends upon where you're applying and also too if you have a contact with a contact at that company maybe they can follow up on your behalf as well I do that oh, a lot yeah I love that and so if you followed up after a week you know maybe you followed up at, you know another week after that I have a chapter in my book interning 101 called don't fear the phone you know, so at that point, if you're, you know, you you followed up a couple of times and you're applying for an internship or an entry level job, it's okay to call and be like, hey, I just wanted to check in and see if you got my resume. And maybe the person's like, oh, let me dig it out. Yeah. Okay, cool. You know, like, and um, everyone here has extremely strong live industry backgrounds. The live industry in particular, like, they don't, like, I mean, not always, like, they schedule calls sometimes, but they'll just call you. You know, like that's how shows get booked. That's how agents work. Um, that's how concert promoters work. So don't fear the phone. I promise it'll be okay. Um, okay, so you followed up, you made that phone call, they found your resume, you scored the interview. Um, what are some tips to prepare for a music industry interview? Or any interview. Do your research know the company, I don't say backwards and forwards, but 
know what that company does, know who the principals are, check out some recent press releases, who's on their lineup, and and have a reason on why you want to work there. I love that. Know who you're speaking with, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> right. I just dropped into the chat too. Um, we have some resources on pitching yourself. How do you uh, communicate your strengths? Um, again, aligned with the job and the role um, that you're that you're heading into. Um, your strongest skills, your unique accomplishments, um, and and as just to reiterate what Nancy said why you would be perfect for this role too. Yeah, with skills, not just, I love music and I wanna work at, you know, Shoes and Live Nation, et, et cetera. Um, great, and also, you know, my great attorney, Joyce Dollinger, was it Joyce? Or maybe it was, maybe it was the person who had uh, Nancy's job um, at Northeastern's music business co-op program prior, was practice, you know? And that can be as simple as just getting together with a friend and asking, you know, mock questions. Um, and take care of yourself, get sleep, you know, practice some daily movement, um, and maybe try meditating, you know, for a minute uh, or so um, before you go in for that interview. I'm like the queen of like meditating in bathrooms and random spaces and whatever, wherever. Um, what you do And your superwoman poses too, don't forget yeah. that. Yeah, I love I that. Agree. Right before. Exactly. <laughs> and that's why it is important I, to go on a walk, right? And like, feel good, you know, if you're able to go on a walk, feel, you know, move if you can feel good in your mind and body. Um, okay. It's great for regulating your nervous system. I think okay. that breathing is excellent. And yeah. I would go before I would play a gig, I'd go into the bathroom and look myself in the eyes and say, you know, you really worked hard to be here and prepared for this go have fun. You can do that with an interview too. You know, you just, you have to sort of psych yourself up for these different opportunities, whether it's an interview or. I totally agree. And I used to be super nervous for internship interviews. Um, but by the time I was graduating college, um, I actually looked forward to interviews because I was excited to share my work. And although I do speaking and moderating and whatever, we are talking about introverts, ex extroverts. I'm very introverted um, in the way that Christine said, I get energy from being alone, you know? So um, yeah, just know that like, we're all human. It's like, we're all, we're all figuring this stuff out. Okay, um, so you've, you've just done your interview. Um, what should you do after your interview? And it's in the follow-up email, of course, um, and I don't know if people get taught this as much anymore, but you send the follow-up, you send the thank you. Um, one thing I always like to add into my follow-up um, was something, either something you talked about, something you referenced, something that was interesting, and was another like layer of like, look, I am an interesting human being. Um, I am interested in this role. I'm interested in this company. Um, an example, like an easy example. So I previously worked at a company that did live music travel experiences. It was a combination of travel and live music. Um, and so after the call, my first call, it went really well, et cetera, et cetera. And for it, I was like, hey, thank you so much. Really interested in the role, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, oh, also, I run a travel blog. I think I might mention on the call. Here's links to my travel blog. Check it out so you know how much I love travel. Um, wasn't necessarily as related to the specific role, but it was something like, hey, I'm an interesting, fully well-rounded person that does have a genuine interest in this role. Um, and I think that also goes back to the earlier in terms of like preparing is Oftentimes I hear people say like, hey, I like oh, I want to work in music and I'll ask them what they want to do and they'll say, oh, anything. And I'm like, it's a thing a hiring manager absolutely does not want to hear is that I'd be willing to take literally any role that anyone will give me in the music industry. Um, and so making sure you have the answer to why do I want this role? Why am I best qualified for this role? What is my unique selling proposition for this role is really, really important. And then figure out how to sell that constantly in terms of throughout the interview with your follow up message, you know, with your thank you, et cetera, et cetera, throughout the course of the actual process. I love that. And we just have a few minutes. So, okay, you've got the gig, you've got the internship, you've got, you've got the job. What stands out to you all, um, you know, from interns and entry-level folks in the industry? That's a great question. Um, I think that what Christine said about the follow-up email, that attention to detail, the, again, this is question, how do you stand above the rest? Like what makes this one resume or this one person um, uh, doing the research, follow up, 
uh, kindness. Um, you know, there's a, you hear this often about, you never know. I mean, somebody that I met 18 years later, he created a role for me. Like you never know when these relationships, Emily, you can point in like the, your best friends or your neighbors were your bosses and stay kind, you know? I mean, we all want kind, happy people around us that, and so if you can come into rooms and 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 shine even through the Zoom, we'll feel it. Um, and so bring, always bring that, your best self uh, to that space with the research and kindness and, and, and be intentional on your, on how you're speaking to that person, understanding where they're coming from and the role that you're applying to. I think all of those dots will just click and, and then you can keep doing it because that's, you know, we, we learn, I think a handful of us that came through that artist path, you stand up. You do the best that you can. You show the best you. And if that didn't work, then you move on. I mean, that's part of that skin that we have to learn always in this process, too, is, is how do we continue to, you know, um, understand our strength and, and, and hold our ego a little bit here, too, um, and continue. Don't, don't make yourself something for that job, even if it's not who you are always be you and i think we you you'll we'll be able to tell for sure i like that authentic um representation for sure amazing and and we just have a few minutes so i'll add and then i have one more question i'll add quickly to that um you know how to stand out is doing the things you say you'll do replying to everything i will hire anyone that replies to everything. That's what I say in my internship and entry level job, internship interviews in particular. We need you to do everything we ask you to do. Um, and I, I ask for 24 business hours, which means um, if we send you something on a Friday, you have until Monday to do it. We don't expect people to be working nights and weekends and whatever. And if you can't do something, that's okay. You just have to tell us so someone else can do it. And a lot of students and uh you know, potential interns laugh in the interviews when I say that. And I would say about 50% fail. Um, so reply to everything. Um, and then last question, um, if in real life networking is intimidating, uh, what's an example of an icebreaker question? My go-to question is, what are you excited about right now? And people tell me all kinds of things to, from like vacations to like what they're excited about at work. I don't care. I just it's fun to know what you're excited about because I love when people talk about things they're interested in and passionate about, it opens up a conversation way more than just like, oh, hey, what do you do? Or whatever it might be. Amazing. I don't, know if I, yeah, saw, uh, I don't know if I saw this in a, in a social media or what, but, you know, what did you do on your last birthday? That's, you know, sort of, a random question, but usually that's a happy moment. You remember what you did. And and Christine, to your point, I like it when an answer opens up another conversation. In an interview, I asked someone, uh, can you describe an activity where you're an expert? And this person talked about their coffee ritual and the machines that they used and how they love to make espresso and different beads that they use. And we saw a completely different side of that candidate that make them more than what you said, very authentic, you know, relatable and human. I love that. I dropped some more resources. This is as you're even in the field that you're meeting professionals. These are just ways to learn about their jobs, their roles, be curious, stay curious. We can't, you've heard us all say this, um, uh, ask questions, stay connected to folks. Once you meet them, then you link them in and now you're connected and you're following them on, on their journey, on, on their professional journey. And you can start finding those connecting points uh, there too. But I think that those questions are, are excellent. Just be curious of the person who you're speaking to. Ask where they're from, you know, like that's what I asked at my first internship um, interview ever that I was so nervous for. And that boss that I referenced, it was 23 and I was 19. She was from Chicago. I was originally from Milwaukee. That kind of put me at ease a little bit, you know, and really quick, like be authentic, be yourself. You don't want to fake it. But it's like, I always give the example, like 
Mark Cates, who manages MGMT and worked with Nirvana and is a legend in the industry, his company is called Fenway Recordings. So if you like anything about Boston sports, Mark is going to want to talk your ear off all night at a show, you know, about that. So um, let's give it up for our amazing panelists. Thank you so much, Nareet, Christine, Nancy. We need to let uh, Christine uh, travel safely on her flight, um, but we will be posting this full video um, and then hopefully emailing it out to everyone and maybe with some additional resources as well. So thank you so much to Shira, Noel, Denzel, everyone at New York Music Month. Um, keep checking out all the incredible free events um, online and throughout New York. Thanks so much. Thank you, Emily. Thanks everybody for watching. Yeah. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you.